Aula Mediterranea, in this occasion organized by the EMED, the European Institute for the Mediterranean, and the Masters in International Journalism of the Valencarno School of Communication and International Relations at the Ramon Llull University. It's with great pleasure that we introduce Lahit Higel, Senior Analyst at the International Crisis Group, to whom we have asked to explain her vision of Iraq almost 20 years after the American occupation. And I think very graphically, her conference is, is about to entitle Iraq, a source of perpetual instability or a rising democracy. I think it is a very clever question to, to, uh, to, um, to start with the debate. With the MSc in International Relations from the London School of Economics and an AMA in International Security from Science Po, she has carried out research on governance and security in Iraq and Kurdistan for institutions such as the European Union or the United Nations Development Programme. And lately, he, she has worked as a mediator advisor in Iraq, in Libya, if I'm not wrong, and Syria too for uh, the Dialogue Advisory Group. After the lecture, we will have the chance to exchange some ideas with her. And to do so, you are all invited to send your questions through the question and answer tool of this Zoom page. And for those who follow us through the YouTube screen, uh, sorry, stream channel, you can send your questions uh, through there. Uh, we will gather them all uh, and convey them to, to Lahib. Lahib, thanks. Thank you very much uh, for being here with us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and for hosting me tonight. I'm uh, very sorry to not be able to be with you in person in Barcelona, uh, but unfortunately with the pandemic, this is, this is what the reality is. So instead, um, I'm with you from Baghdad and uh, I hope that the session will run smoothly with the potential for electricity cuts, but I should still be there if the screen goes black, just so you know. So I think that we're at a very interesting uh, juncture in Iraqi politics. It has been said many times before, uh, but in terms of our, our question for, for tonight's session of whether Iraq is moving towards uh, more instability or to more stable waters, um, we have quite a few indications of where that might be headed. And I will come to actually answer that question towards the end of the session. But in order to kind of lay out uh, the ground and the context that we're in, I will take you through some of the main junctures in the post-2003 period, uh, but also very quickly now introduce in the beginning kind of the context in which Iraq emerged from in, in 2003. So as, as you all know, um, the invasion came at the backdrop of, of four decades of, of dictatorship uh, in Iraq, uh, mainly under Ba'athist regime and, and for um, uh, the last years under, under Saddam Hussein. Um, this was enabled through uh, the first coup against the monarchy in Iraq in, in 1958, which installed the first republic. It unleashed a series of coups uh, where different military leaders took over power and which eventually led to the rise of, of Saddam Hussein in, in 1963. I, um, the, the situation in the region at the time was very much one of, of uh, mirroring this type of environment between the countries in the region. Uh, Arab nationalism was very much on the rise with different competing interpretations of it, one of them being the sort of Nasserist version in, in Egypt and, and the Balkis being in a, another model. Um, Iraq during the 60s and the 70s was a relatively stable, relatively open society. Uh, Iraq hailed itself with being at the top of, of both education system, health systems, etc. Um, but then this started to unravel towards the end of the 70s and with the entry of, of Saddam into the war with, with Iran in, in the 80s that lasted for, for eight years. Um, uh, the country already then was uh, uh, both in terms of its security forces and, and, and as a society uh, very tired, but 
immediately after came the, the invasion of, of Kuwait. And this was kind of really the descending of the country into, uh, into a very difficult place with the toughest sanctions regime that, that has been seen in, in, in the modern period uh, that lasted for, for almost a decade in the 90s. Now, the most important development that happened in the, in the pre-2003 period that had a great impact for what we saw coming during the, the US occupation was the establishment of the no-fly zones in Iraq, and particularly the one in the Kurdistan region that was established to protect the Kurds uh, from the previous uh, ethnic cleansing that they had experienced under the Saddam regime. This entailed um, a lot um, wide uh, independent uh, kind of autonomous governance structure in the Kurdistan region that was quite separated from the central government in Baghdad. And so when the US invasion came and, and so with that, the negotiations for what a new state structure would look like, the Kurds were at an advantage in those negotiations. So I won't go into um, you know, the background of the, of the 2003 invasion. I think that uh, many of you uh, know that very well, um, but at the inception, uh, the US established the so-called CPA, uh, the Coalition Provisional Authority led under Paul Bremer. Uh, during that period, uh, the US uh, was in talks mainly with political elites from the exiled uh, Iraqi diaspora and mainly Kurdish leaders and Shia leaders. Um, they came to certain agreements. The US set up what was called uh, the tra transitional administrative law, which functioned as a temporary constitution until the actual constitution was voted on in 2005. Um, the conditions for this that were uh, discussed with the, the Grand Ayatollah uh, Ali Sistani uh, was, was one of the idea that the transitional constitution would not necessarily precondition the constitution that would actually be voted on. But what happened in reality is that the main core tenets of that interim constitution was the one that actually led the way for what was voted on later. Um, this was not a constitution that many Iraqis were privy to. In fact, the conversations around it was very much held in uh, behind locked doors. Uh, and even as they tried to integrate um, also some Sunni elements, uh, many Shia, political leaders were also excluded in the process, especially towards the end. What happened with this was that one of the, the kind of main uh, features of it uh, was the question of uh, a central versus a decentralized government. Iraq had been highly centralized, obviously, during the authoritarian rule under Saddam. There was an idea that the country required a decentralized, a decentralized type of, of federalism. There was already an example of this in the Kurdistan region, which enjoyed quite some autonomy. And so this was integrated into the constitution with the idea that other parts of Iraq would also be able to become regions of their own in the future. However, the modalities for this weren't uh, properly uh, sort of laid out. And so what we've had is kind of an unviable situation where uh, other parts of the country might want the advantages of, of becoming a region, but, but you cannot actually implement it. In fact, there is one of the main tensions in sort of post-2003 Iraq has very much been between what the central government should do versus the region. And hence, for instance, um, uh, dividing up uh, budget between the Kurdistan region and the central versus other provinces. So this was one of the main issues and that still has not been, been resolved. Um, the US made uh, a few other quite uh, detrimental, I would say, uh, mistakes at, at the start of the occupation of which we still see the results of. 
uh, one of them was disbanding the army. Um, this had the effect that thousands of soldiers were all of a sudden without a job, but with arms that they took home. Um, the other one was uh, the, um, the disbanding of the, of the Ba'athist party. That included or affected not only uh, high level members of the party, but it went across the board, meaning that also civilian government employees, such as teachers, for instance, were also kind of uh, forced out of a job which caused uh, severe grievances. Um, meanwhile, and as I, as I mentioned, the, the, the result of, of the occupation was that in came a new political elite, many of which had been quite removed from the reality of Iraq. They had been displaced or exiled in, in neighboring countries or in Western countries. Many of these elites came back with, with little direct uh, contact with, with their new constituencies in Iraq. Of all of these parties that there was potentially one leader that we can say that was uh, truly domestic and which is one of the main uh, uh, dominant uh, Shia leaders today, which is which is Muqtada Sadr, and we will come back to those uh, dynamics a little bit later. But what it showed very early on was that uh, the Iraqi political class was not really able to make independent decisions. They were either dependent on very much on the U.S. in the beginning, and later, as we we will see, also of course in relations with Iran or the Gulf Arab countries, or Turkey, for instance. Now, the initial grievances of, uh, of, of, the, of the process, uh, of which was one of them was to actually vote on the constitution and hold elections, was that the, the Sunni community boycotted the initial elections. This sort of paved the way initially for uh, domination of, of mainly Shia parties and, and Kurdish parties into the political scene. Uh, we saw early on a resistance that emerged uh, not only in terms of, of a Sunni insurgency, but also uh, Shia militias that, that resisted the, the occupation. And so uh, as soon as 2000, and with the end of 2005, we had the onset of, of a very bloody sectarian war that took place in the central and, and southern parts of Iraq. It entailed uh, um, homogenization of, of previously uh, uh, very diverse cities, such as Baghdad, for instance, that saw um, uh, the Sunni and the Shia communities separated from each other. Um, uh, we saw a, a big exodus of, of Christians, for instance, during this period. The US then launched into what was called the surge in order to, to deal with mainly the Sunni and, and insurgents at, at that time. Uh, and by sort of the end of 2007, early 2008, uh, Iraq was relatively stable. Uh, that was made possible really by the support of the US to then uh, Prime Minister uh, Nouri al-Maliki, uh, which, Became, emerged kind of as, as, a, as a strong man, not only in the sense that he um, controlled many of the security institutions and, and other state institutions, but only also in the sense that he had crushed his rivals, not only among uh, uh, the Sunni resistant groups, but also on the Shia side. For instance, uh, Muqtada Sadr, uh, during those years had uh, a very well-known uh, militia called the Mahdi army, uh, which Maliki fought with US help and crushed in 2008. Um, the, the government that then kind of continued on with, with Maliki as its leader started to show uh, again, very authoritarian uh, modalities of, of governing. Um, he managed to win also the 2010 election, uh, uh, but not through getting the most amount of seats, uh, but being able to form the government. And that was based on int an interpretation by, by the federal court in terms of what was the largest 
block. Um, this, of course, uh, stirred its, it, a new type of, of grievances. Uh, the government embarked on, on marginalizing policies again, uh, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the Sunni community or, or its leaders. At the same time, there were many flaws within the constitution that were left unaddressed. Um, many articles that, that needed uh, to be tackled that weren't, for instance, and one of the, the main ones is the so-called Article 140 uh, that deals with the disputed territories. There's a line of provinces uh, that go between what is federal Iraq and what is the Kurdistan region. Um, the, there was an expiration date for this article in 2007 in the middle of the sectarian war, um, which stipulated that there should have been a normalization, meaning a reversal of the, the Saddam uh, Arabization policies against uh, Kurds and other minorities uh, in these areas. This had not happened. Uh, there was also supposed to be a census in these areas and thereafter uh, a referendum that would determine whether these areas would be a part of the, Kurdis, uh, the Kurdistan region or remain under federal Iraq or whether they, there would be another specific uh, status for them. Uh, one that was discussed for Kirkuk was, uh, was essentially a region of its own. Uh, so many of these issues were, were left to linger, and at the same time, we had a revival of the uh, of the Sunni uh, insurgency, which was helped by the chaos in in neighboring Syria. Um, so, by 2011 and 12, there were widespread protests in what we know as the Sunni areas in, in central Iraq. These were seriously crushed uh, by by the central government. And this is what gave the impetus for uh, a revival of or a rebranding of what we knew as, as Al-Qaeda uh, into ISIS, and, and, and uh, especially in 2013, where they took over a city like Fallujah and Anbar. And then, as you, as you all know, we came into 2014, and, and the full onslaught uh, came in, in June, with the Iraqi army withdrawing like a domino effect through the central uh, parts of Iraq from Mosul all the way down to Diyala and, and essentially reaching the, the outskirts of, of Baghdad. Um, now, apart from, from that bringing the US back in, and sorry, I forgot to mention, um, uh, the US withdrew its troops from Iraq in, in 2011. Uh, this brought the US back in. Uh, the other most critical development out of this was that uh, the fight against ISIS uh, established what is called the Hashd al-Shabi, uh, based on a fatwa or a religious decree by Grand Ayatollah Sistani, who called on all able-bodied men to take up arms and volunteer within the security institutions. Now, what really happened uh, was not so much a recruitment into the uh, into institutions such as the army or the federal police that respectively go under the Ministry of uh, Defense and Interior. Many of the, the Shia armed groups or militias that had been dormant for some years uh, took up arms again, reorganized and recruited many of the volunteers, especially in the South, into their ranks and thereby established what we know as the, the Hashd al-Shabi Commission or, or the popular, popular Mobilization Forces. This was mainly made up of, of Shia armed groups, but it also inclu included minority groups in the areas that, that were controlled uh, or that were, were seeking to get liberated, uh, including Christians, Yazidis, Turkmen, Shebek. Um, and so as the, uh, the war uh, developed, these uh, armed groups became increasingly powerful in these areas. Uh, they benefited out of the, uh, the, the cooperation between the coalition forces, between the Iraqi security forces and the Kurdish Peshmerga. The, the war changed the political field in, in two major ways, I would say. One of them was that in 2014, 
uh, the Kurdish uh, forces took advantage of the vacuum that the Iraqi army left and pushed into the areas that I previously described as the so-called disputed territories. A um, string of areas that go from, from the province of, of Nainawa in the west, uh, the border with Syria, all the way to, to Diyala with the, with the border of, of Iran. And so they controlled chunks of territory uh, where they established front lines also fighting ISIS from the north, uh, while the Iraqi security forces backed by, by, by the Hashd al-Shabi world were sort of fighting and pushing up uh, from the south. Um, a critical point came towards the, the end of the, the, the military operations or, or the military victory over ISIS uh, towards the end of 2017. Um, that was when uh, the Kurdish authorities decided to hold uh, a referendum on independence. They decided to do it not only in the Kurdistan region, but also in the areas that they controlled outside of the region, meaning in, in the, the disputed territories. Uh, this sparked a serious reaction from the central government, but it was also backed by other countries such as Iran and Turkey, uh, who opposed a potential uh, independent Kurdistan. And it was in generally, uh, in, in general, they were advised not to do it by, by the wider international community, including Western countries. However, they went ahead with it. And, and very quickly on after, after the referendum was held in September, uh, 2017, uh, the Iraqi uh, federal forces pushed up towards these areas to reclaim them from the Kurdish forces. Um, at this time, people were very concerned that, that the next phase of, of all of this war, which was to fight ISIS, which actually turned into a fight between Shia armed groups and the Kurdish forces. Now, this the worst case scenario didn't really material, materialize. Um, there were brief clashes in Kirkuk, but, but mainly the Kurdish forces retreated which means that they, they, they left the, the areas that they had, had controlled during the fight over ISIS uh, from Sinjar to, to Kirkuk and, and, and other parts of the al and Salah Adin, for instance. Um, this really set the uh, uh, Shia groups at, at uh, an advantage. Um, they had not only become um, a military force, but also a political and an economic force. Throughout these areas that they helped recapture, they established uh, businesses, they established political offices, they uh, controlled much of the, of the traffic, uh, both internal within Iraq through checkpoints, uh, but also border crossings on the, on the side with Iran, as well as on the side with, uh, with Syria. Uh, at this point, they had really positioned themselves also through the fact that many of them had already uh, were established as political parties that had previously competed in elections. So in 2018, um, they uh, made a great success. Um, they came, came in with, with force into parliament. Uh, many of them that had previously not repre been represented that way all of a sudden had had MPs. Um, and although that uh, election was not very much different from previous elections in Iraq in that we had a consensus government which included most of the political actors, including Shia, Sunnis, and Kurds, um, they became a dominant force in the government. At the same time, we had two, uh, I would say, very important developments uh, going on. One uh, regionally or at the international level, and the other one was, was, was more national. The first one, um, the regional one, was the tensions between uh, Iran and the US. Uh, under the, the Trump administration, the US left the, the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, in May 2018. Um, this increased the tensions not only inside Iraq with, with some or many of these militias being connected to Iran uh, and started uh, in, in parallel of continuing to, to fight the remaining insurgency of ISIS were also resisting what they call uh, the US occupation. Uh, there were also 
you know, tensions uh, in other parts of the region, but I will not go in uh, so much into that. Um, the other important development was what was happening uh, in inside the country and especially, especially on the societal level. So Iraq had navigated into calmer waters uh, during these years with the um, uh, with the victory over ISIS, but also the Iraqi South had not really experienced war during this period. They were quite shielded. Um, it's an area of the country that has been neglected since 2003, highly impoverished provinces, and yet they are uh, majority Shia, and they have been ruled by Shia governance since 2003. And so hence, there was a, a serious questioning of why this was the case. Uh, the demographics of Iraq, and especially in this region, are highly tilted towards the youth. So we have uh, um, some 60% of the population being under the age of, of, of 25. So many of them had, had not experienced um, the authoritarian rule of Saddam. They had were maybe too young to even remember uh, the sectarian war of, of 2006 and seven. Um, and so they were seeing themselves in a place where their where their future prospects are very poor, despite living in a, in a fairly rich country. Um, so the grievances during these years uh, had been magnifying, really, and we had seen protests from 2015 uh, related to corruption, related to uh, poor service delivery um, uh, in these provinces. It culminated uh, in 2018 uh, with serious pro protests in, in the southern uh, most city of, of Iraq, Basra. Um, the, the protests were seriously crushed by, by the government, um, but there was also another, uh, let's say, feature to them in comparison to previous protests in the sense that many of the people in the South connected the corruption, not just to the parties, uh, but also to the interference of Iran. So there was seen as a, kind of a coherent uh, 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 team working against the people in the sense that the elites uh, were amassing all of the wealth to themselves. And not only were they doing it on, on their own behalf, but also on, on behalf of, of Iran. And so these, this, these dynamics also played in to the tensions between the US uh, and Iran at the time. Um, Despite the protests being uh, crushed in 2018, there was a renewal of them, uh, of what we know as, and became the, the largest uh, protest movement in Iraq uh, that erupted uh, in October 2019, uh, called the Tashreen Movement. And so these kind of grassroots forces that have been working uh, over the years uh, came together in a quite in an organic manner. It was not that the protests were uh, organized in any way, but it was a, again a reaction to the government's pretty harsh response to initially student marches that, that started in September. Then after that, uh, thousands of people started amassing in Tahrir Square in Baghdad, uh, in other parts of the Southern provinces. Uh, they set up sit-in demonstrations that lasted for, for several months uh, and at the same time taking on a very harsh response from the Iraqi government, from various security forces, but, it's, but it seemed like uh, the main violence was actually led by uh, some of the militias under this uh, umbrella of the Hashd al-Shabi and with support from um, uh, uh, from Iran. The, uh, the size of these protests was really unprecedented. And the fact that they didn't go home uh, actually led to a lot of pressure onto the government. Uh, and one of the main supporters of this was actually the Marja'iya, or uh, represented by, by Grand Ayatollah uh, Ali Sistani. Um, a few of the demands that came out of this protest was, well, the biggest demands were really the overhaul of the entire uh, 
post-2003 system uh, with political apportionments between the ethno-sectarian groups, new elections, uh, and demands for what they called uh, a nation. Now, these are quite elusive concepts, of course, but one of the main outcomes of this was actually that the prime minister at the time, Adel Abdel Mahdi, stepped down um, and paved the way for new elections that were held uh, in October 2021. In the meantime, we had an, an interim, go interim government that is still in place. Now, this can be seen as, as quite a large victory, let's say, for, for the, the democratic forces in Iraq. But at the same time, what we're seeing is this that is that this highly uh, illegitimate or what in, in the eyes of the people, uh, a state or a system in the legitimacy crisis is actually quite strong. So the, the protests were successful in the sense that they managed to attract some of the major political parties onto their side, or at least Partly, I'm not going to go into the dynamics of the protests and, and how it evolved because, because there are a lot of details for it. But we could say that there are some of the major uh, political parties that have uh, uh, you know, gone on to this, this wave, uh, uh, also demanding reform to the system, but importantly, not the overthrow of the system, which is what uh, many of these, uh, these activists and, and demonstrators demanded. Um, one of the main figures that emerged out of this was uh, uh, Muqtada Sadr, who I uh, mentioned uh, briefly in the beginning. Um, he's a figure that has been very controversial in Iraqi politics throughout the, the post-2003 period. As I said, uh, fought the US occupation, then withdrew, came back into politics, and have uh, branded himself as, as a nationalist, as someone that rejects both the Iranian interference and the US interference in Iraq. And now is sort of trying to lead this, this transformation, although many people are questioning whether that can actually happen. Um, Southern and a few other parties uh, uh, made a very successful election, uh, thanks to the fact that the uh, election law uh, was changed. Uh, they were instrumental in, in, in formulating it in a way that it actually suited the way that their constituencies uh, um, are, um, are distributed in Iraq. And so uh, between Muqtada Sadr, who came out first in this election, uh, there was also significant wins for uh, uh, Sunni political parties, especially the one that was led of current parliament speaker, Mohammed al fabusi uh, and the third one being uh, the Kurdistan Democratic uh, Party. Uh, together, they actually have an, an alliance of, of three that make up sort of half of, of the parliament. Uh, and they were able to uh, re-elect uh, the, the current parliament speaker, Mohammed al halbusi On the other side, the main losing parties uh, were the ones that have been associated to be uh, in the Iranian camp, mainly those that are uh, related to, to the Hashid. Uh, so as I said, many of these, the grievances that, that were aired in the, in the post-ISIS period against these parties was, was very much reflected in the election result. Now, it doesn't mean that they still have constituencies that support them, but it is all, they also lost because of the fact that they didn't read the new election law uh, uh, in the way that uh, the Sadrists or, or the KDP, for instance, did. Um, the other uh, major leader who, who fared quite well in the, in the elections but can still be seen a, on the losing side is, is former Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, who um, together with these parties and a few of the other uh, losing Shia parties have, have created a camp of their own on the other side. Now, what is interesting in this election and what is kind of unprecedented uh, in, in these previous elections in Iraq and, and today is that uh, Muqtada Sadr is, is trying to part ways from the consensus governments that have been the feature 
uh, of every election since 2005, meaning that all of the main political parties come together to form the government. They divide up uh, 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 ministries and other important positions within the state structures between themselves and sort of in that way perpetuate uh, the, the corrupt system that we have. The aim of Sadr, together with his, his partners, has, has been to create a so-called majority government. Uh, now, they have come into some serious obstacles, obviously, because the other side is, is rejecting this idea of being excluded from government, uh, also with the, with the support of Iran that does not want to see a breakup of the Shia political elite. So Sadr going it alone, uh, without uh, his other Shia counterparts. And so now we're standing at, at a standstill where uh, they were able to, to, to elect a new parliament speaker, but what has happened recently is that uh, they failed to get a quorum of two thirds that is required to, to elect the president. Um, there are many facets to why this hasn't really worked out. One of them being uh, divisions within the Kurdish camp, so between uh, the Kurdistan Democratic Party and, and the, the PUK, which currently holds the presidency. But really, it is not so much about the presidency itself. It is really about the next step, which would be the prime minister, and whether this person would also be coming out of this so-called tripartite alliance. Now, um, we're at a point where um, it can go either way. So in a sense, uh, we might, again, Iraqis forced into a new scenario of a consensus government, which means that we will not see much of a change in terms of what it was that the protest movement demanded. On the other hand, the deadlock is, is quite severe, meaning that there, there is a chance for, for early uh, elections or new elections again in, 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 in order to resolve this deadlock. Now, apart from what this means in terms of the, the daily politics today, uh, uh, the question that I want to, to end with is, is where we're headed in general for Iraq at, at this point. Um, we know that we have a system that is uh, in a deep legitimacy crisis. Uh, it does not seem to be able to really reform itself. Uh, at the same time, we know that foreign intervention to resolve Iraq's internal issues has not worked in the past. On the one hand, we have some positive signs, of course, and that is the kind of grassroots demogra uh, uh, democratic forces uh, that actually also made an inroad into parliament this time uh, with some 20 seats among new parties and with some independent candidates. Now, those are, of course, very small to actually have an impact uh, when it comes to the government formation in this phase. Uh, if they are able to uh, organize themselves better for the next election, we might see uh, a larger impact of, of kind of uh, democratically minded forces in, in Iraqi parliament. However, what we're also seeing at the same time is that, that the status quo powers are, are very strong. And there is a serious question, I think, to wonder whether where a, a personality like Muqtada Sadr actually wants to take this uh, development and whether he will be the reformist that he claims to be. And I think uh, many in Iraq highly doubt that. Um, the other side of this is that um, we're in a neighborhood in general that, that is unstable and we are surrounded by countries that are, are still at war, Syria being, of course, one of them that still impacts also what happens in Iraq. It doesn't seem that there are uh, many indications of kind of a new insurgency emerging in Iraq at this point, uh, but the grievances are there for it to develop in the future. So this period is quite critical. Um, and I would say that the Iraqi political forces right now are at a very important kind of stage of maturity politically. And the real test here is whether they can actually resolve their issues between themselves without having to have 
external powers supporting them in either direction. So whether that is Iran, whether that is the Gulf Arab states, for instance, or Turkey. And the key here would really also be to see if the international community and especially the regional powers that look into Iraq are, are able to, to support it in a way without necessarily interfering in, an, in the internal affairs uh, to the extent that it has a backlash. We saw that Iran's interference over the years has had uh, a backlash in terms of popular opinion. That might very well happen uh, on the other side as well, if, if we see that there would be kind of a, a, a stronger pivot to, towards, towards the other side. And so I think this is where um, uh, the main fault lines are at the moment. Um, so there is, there is a potential that, that could grow, but that also requires Iraq to remain fairly stable. Uh, and at the same time, there are indications that this might uh, not work out simply because these political powers are in a position where they cannot fathom not being in government. And the idea of an opposition doesn't really exist uh, in Iraqi politics, although we have a democratic system. And so the big question mark remains whether some of these forces was, will actually start uh, fighting each other. Um, Okay, I think I will stop there. Um, thank you so much. I know that this was uh, a lot of ground to cover, but I'm happy to take on any questions of what I didn't cover. Thank you very much, Khalifa. It has been really, really very interesting. I don't know if, I don't see any questions right now. I don't know if there is anyone through the uh, YouTube channel. Um, I don't see any, so. We can give just some minutes for our audience to think some. If not, I have uh, just a few questions to pose to you. So we can start then. Um, probably because I come from, a, well, I'm a teacher of a master degree in journalism. I really were interested in the, in the role that civil society and all the actors according what we consider are in, in a democratic uh, society plays accordingly in Iraq. For example, the media. The media, what, what, what's the role the, media, the Iraqi media is playing right now? Uh, and, and I would like you to please go in, in probably in deep with the description of this uh, grassroots democratic forces, meaning how the civil society is organizing themselves rather than in, in the political parties. Okay, thank you for that question. It's a, it's a very important one, I think. So what's interesting with the, um, media landscape in Iraq is that it's actually much better or freer, let's say, than in many of the neighboring countries, uh, which are um, highly authoritarian. Um, so we actually have quite a big diversity of media outlets that uh, represent the different types of opinions or uh, or allegiances, let's say, that, that exist uh, within the country. Um, this doesn't mean that, you know, uh, Iraq is a safe place for any type of, of freedom of expression. Um, we saw very much that, that uh, um, the protest in 2019, which opened up the space for many Iraqis that had previously not kind of voiced their opinions, uh, were targeted uh, by, uh, by the state, by armed groups. Um, but what is interesting is that it's not the state so much that is driving this type of, of repression at the moment, at least. It has been more uh, by these kind of uh, uh, auxiliary forces. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, and then when it comes to your, to your second uh, question uh, in terms of how civil society operates, um, well, I mean, so we have, there are, of course, uh, several layers to it. Um, there, there has been uh, a growing uh, civil society type of movement or engagement uh, during the whole post-2003 period. Much of that emerged out of the response to the various phases of, of war. So the establishment of, of NGOs, 
uh, etc. Uh, people volunteering for humanitarian purposes and in that way uh, uh, gaining quite some, some experience that has been helpful in organizing in other ways. And then there is, is also like a, a part of civil society that I think is did exist all, already before um, in the way that Iraqi society was uh, uh, was working prior to, to 2003 or, or even before like the, the major wars in terms of um, cultural institutions, um, uh, unions, um, various different uh, clubs organizing uh, uh, cultural events. Many of these actually started operating outside of the country um, through the diaspora, for instance. And so there has also been an influence of that. And then at the same time, we have had, I mean, during the whole post-2003 period, of course, with, with kind of the idea of, of a democratic system and, and liberal values that have been many organizations that, that work uh, um, as type of advocacy uh, platforms for, for women's rights, for children's rights, et cetera. And so many of these organizations have, have, have come together, but I would say that in the role of the protest specifically, uh, it was more of a of a youthful rage, I think, that that brought people together. And then some of them were absorbed by political parties or formed political parties. Others have remained more uh, organizing themselves in in a in a more traditional type of of, of civil society. Let me check the question answer. Um, I don't see any. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, from uh, Jaume Flaque, who is the director of the Cathedra, Cathedra Andaluza for the Andalus Cathedra for the Interreligious Dialogue in the University of Loyola. Uh, he asks Is there any process of secularization of the population? or even a kind of rejection of religious religions after having seen how violence haven't been justified religiously? Um, well, yes, I, I think that well, sec secularization, um, I'm not sure if it's, if it's the right type of, of way to describe it, uh, but definitely among, among especially the kind of younger demographic that is, there is a, a rejection if not directly of, of religion, that at least of the political expressions of religion. So, I mean, Iraq has gone through phases where several ideologies have failed, right? So from Arab nationalism to the sectarian politics to uh, political Islam, uh, both in its, in its kind of Sunni expressions of Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, uh, or uh, uh, the more kind of Iranian inspired uh, that, that it hasn't ever really been able to take root properly in Iraq. But then there is um, other expressions of religion which are more cultural, of course. And, and I think that those still remain within, within society. And I think what was interesting during the protest, for instance, was to see how many of these activists and demonstrators were actually using uh, Islamic symbolism uh, to push back against against government policies, for instance. So, so yes, I think that there has been a general kind of liberalization of of, of Iraqi uh, society that has come with with the country opening up and having, uh, you know, being part of the of the global community and and the young people are are very much represented in that, and so they are influenced of, uh, you know with foreign ideas of which secular, secularism is, is one. Um, that doesn't mean that, that, that sort of uh, Iraqi society is, is becoming less Islamic, let's say. I have, okay, I have another one. Um, to your opinion, what do you think will be the needed steps or concrete decisions that the Iraqi government should take in order to reestablish this or recover this legitimacy 
that the uh, Iraqis, the Iraqi society is asking for. I mean, for example, how to re-establish re the legitimacy is that what you said? in concrete steps, for example. I mean, I was thinking, for example, if there is any claim to thinking on justice and if there is any claim for starting any kind of process of, uh, of um, uh, to, to, to judge the, the crimes committed in the, in the, in the past years. So a, a kind of a tribunal of justice and, 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 and pardoned, for example. So I, I think that the problem is that there, we, we don't really have um, like institutions that, that, that are uh, independent in a way that you can um, pursue accountability in, in, a, in a broad sense. Um, the current government has, has sought to seek accountability for some of the crimes that were committed during the protest, but those have been very uh, selective in terms of the, the people that they have targeted um, and has not gone on a sort of institutional uh, basis when it comes to all security forces, for instance. What it would require, I think, to recover legitimacy in general is, of course, that Iraqis are suffering from, from very poor life conditions despite uh, being an oil-rich country. Um, electricity is not reliable in Iraq. Water quality is not reliable in Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, what it would require is actually for the same political forces that are implicit in the corruption to actually address some of that in order to then be able to, uh, 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 to serve the, the public better. And, and this is a very difficult equation, of course. Uh, but again, I think that there is, there are a few good indications of more accountability happening in the future, simply by the fact that we have new political forces in parliament that can actually question the established political elites. Thank you very much. There are two questions right now. Um, the first one is from Nad Abdel Slamat uh, and says, you say that young protesters were partly absorbed by political parties. So you think this is the case behind stopping these demonstrations or they feeling that is impossible to make any chance, I'm sorry, any change in the sectarian situation under the domination of Iran? And then we will go to the next question when you finish. Okay, um, I think there are uh, many questions we've done to this one, but um, yeah, it's, um, uh, so firstly to kind of answer um, why, why the demonstrations came to an end. Yes, so I mean, there were several factors. There was a fatigue, of course, um, hundreds dead, uh, thousands injured, uh, but there was also a conviction among some of the, the protesters that actually in order to uh, change the system, which has proved very strong, you cannot overthrow it, we, we have to organize ourselves politically. Now, some of them have chosen to organize themselves through new political parties. Others uh, have joined established political parties thinking that they can, um, you know, uh, impact some sort of change from, from within. And then there is another group uh, of the protesters that are extremely disillusioned with the outcome, uh, thinking that, you know, it was really the bare minimum that they were able to achieve. And now we're just seeing the, uh, the, the status quo power coming back, uh, uh, fighting over, over their piece of the pie, just as they have done in every previous election. So I think that that uh, both sides exist. Uh, but in terms of, of um, to make any change under the sectarian situation and the domination of Iran, I'm, I think that uh, many young Iraqis actually reject the idea that sectarianism is, is really something that is um, uh, um, a widespread feature or, or a way of thinking that, that many Iraqis subscribe to today, especially the, the younger demographic does not. Uh, so I think it's, it's mainly a disillusionment with, the, with an extremely corrupt uh, and strong system. 
And the next question comes from Brenda Giacomeni. Um, it is, what do you think that the international community should and could do in order to drive change for Iraq somehow? Well, I mean, I think uh, uh, one thing would be, um, so for instance, um, there has been uh, uh, quite some uh, support when it comes to the economic uh, field. Um, Iraq needs serious improvement uh, when it when it comes to 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 various areas in terms of functioning um, better economically within within the global system. And and I think support that is channeled in that way with with conditions that are put in the right place are are very important. We've seen some improvements of that, for instance, with the current government devaluing uh, the DNR, for instance. There are, other, there are other areas where the international community is, is really important to keep Iraq at the stability that we see currently, which is continued support to, to the Iraqi security forces that are happening through the coalition uh, and through NATO, for instance, uh, in order for Iraq not to slide back to a position where uh, where insurgent groups can easily take over, that is that is required going forward. And, and then I think the other area is actually to support the kind of democratic forces that that we see in the country, but also working in tandem with the established political parties that we cannot just wish away, uh, but but sort of. Um, supporting visions of, of, of new ways of, of governing of, or, or reform without, of course, uh, interventionist policies as, as we have seen in the past that, that always have, have resulted in serious backlash. Um, I, there's another one uh, from Jamma Flake too. Um, Ali Sistan is not going to live much longer as he's very old. He has opposed to the efforts of Iranian Shiism to control the Shiism in Iraq. Uh, he's still the spiritual leader of um, which changes can we expect in Iraqi Shiism after his death, especially if the new leader is pro-Iranian Shiism. This is a very difficult question to answer. Um, it's it's like asking like who who would be the the new pope. Uh, um, the, I mean there are um, there are a few potential uh, successors. Um, uh, people have different interpretation of uh, what direction that they would take, um, but I think in general the. We will, we will not be in a scenario where we have a head of the Marja'iyah in Iraq that is going to propagate for the Vilayat of Faqih in Iraq. Uh, and I think this is something that goes to the particularities of the, of the Marja'iyah uh, in Iraq, which traditionally has, has been a rival of, of Qom. So yes, there might be uh, certain changes in terms of the, the direction or in terms of how the Marja'iya involves itself in politics. For instance, Ali Sistani, uh, Ayatollah Sistani has, has been very much a propagator of, of political quietism. Uh, we might see certain uh, changes in, in that, but in general, uh, I, I would not say that, that we would have uh, the same kind of political ideology emerging or being propagated for from Najaf. Well, I would like to translate, well, well to, to uh, express to you the congratulations that you are receiving from the, from the chat for such clear presentation. So thank you thank very you. much. Um, I don't know if there is anyone who wants to uh, sum up on the debate.
Okay. Um, may I add another one then? Um, what do you, how do you think? Oh, yes, there is no one just, um, no, sorry. Uh, how do you think the pro-Iranian forces in Iraq are going to, to play? Um, if there is no, I mean, in, in the both scenarios, in the case that uh, um, al-Assad could uh, arrange, could, could, could uh, agree with a new uh, government and in this scenario of the new elections, how do you think they are going to, to, to play the card? They, they in the game well i think what we're seeing now and considering the deadlock uh, over the the presidency and hence the rest of the government formation uh, that we have now i think it is very unlikely that we will actually end up with the uh, with the preferred government uh, of, of Sadr or, or the tripartite alliance i think um, the most likely outcome is actually that we have um, another consensus agreement between all parties in order to keep the political peace and actually the societal peace as well. Uh, we've seen, uh, um, you know, uh, political assassinations taking place uh, uh, on the one side involving um, uh, those close to Sadr and on the other side, some of these uh, paramilitary groups uh, in Southern Iraq lately. And this is a very concerning development. And I think we would see more of that if we would actually have this so-called majority government. Uh, and I don't think that anyone in Iraq is, is really keen on, on a conflict. Uh, at the end of the day, for now, oil prices are, are high in Iraq. It should be possible for these political parties to, to come together again and, and, and divide it up. Now, um, that doesn't mean that the tensions will remain for the future. Uh, and I, I can see that there are new lines that are evolving in the narratives of, of some of these uh, uh, Shia armed groups. Uh, now that, for instance, the tensions between Iran and the, and the US have abated, uh, there is a need for, for a new narrative in order to kind of um, justify uh, or, or legitimize their, their, their continued existence. And that is now to focus on uh, other countries that are seen as intervening in Iraqi politics, uh, the United Arab Emirates emerging as one and Turkey emerging as, as another one. And indeed they were both instrumental in, and that's another piece that I didn't bring up in, in this conversation, but in bringing together uh, the main Sunni political parties to unite uh, after this election. So, uh, so I can see that, that many of the dynamics that we've seen in the past will continue. The so-called resistance uh, of these groups uh, that go beyond Iraq uh, will continue. Politically, they will continue uh, uh, to, to push themselves into, uh, into the beneficial position of, of being in, in, in government, uh, whether that is by, by legal means, as we've seen uh, through pressure on, on the federal Supreme Court, or whether that is a, a very tough political opposition or outside of, of, of politics and in, in, uh, uh, in the sense of actually uh, violent actions. So all of those dynamics will, will remain, but, but whether um, they will become more violent or less is, is still a little bit too, too early to predict, I think. Um, have another question from Nad Abdel, Sam Sam Abdel Samad again. Um, is Muqtada Sadar trust in distancing himself from Iran? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, is, if, is Muqtada Sadar trusted in, in his claim of distancing himself from Iran? I don't think that um, any political party in Iraq can can take a full distance uh, from Iran. Uh, in fact, Iran has uh, maintained relations with with all political parties. I would say in Iraq, uh, including Sadr. Sadr at the moment uh, is is rejecting the the idea of of uh, of Iranian interference, but he has also been supported by Iran in the past. Um, this doesn't mean that he's all of a sudden going to, 
to flip flop towards Iran uh, again. But I think that it is unrealistic to think that uh, Sadr somehow uh, is going to actively work against Iran. I, I don't think that uh, this is something that he can do or even wants to do. Uh, I think it's more, uh, at least what he's trying to sell is, is an idea of rebalancing Iraq's foreign relations. Thank you. A new one. Um, is the money coming from the oil petrol helping the democracy, the democratic process, or instead it is creating too much corruption? Uh, yeah, I mean that's the the typical resource curse that that Iraq is is in. Um, of course, I mean being a, a a rentier state in, in many places has, has meant highly corrupt uh, state structures. On the other hand, if, if, if Iraq would have been lucky as, well, let's take the example of Norway being a democratic country already when, when oil was discovered, then, then perhaps this wouldn't have been so much of an issue. Um, but, but yes, I mean, it is, is, it is definitely uh, driving uh, corruption in the sense that uh, this extreme wealth is is possible to siphon off from from a part of of, of the Iraqi elites and and not coming through to to the population. But of course, it's not the oil that is the problem. It's it's those that are managing uh, this wealth that that is the problem. Okay, another question from Pera Frank. Have the Iraqi courts renounced to independence? Is a new referendum forcible in the near future? And how is this issue managed, managed nowadays? Um, so I think that the 2017 referendum and the backlash to it um, really has delayed any kind of progress on, on the Kurdish question in Iraq. Um, I don't foresee that we will have another referendum anytime soon, uh, perhaps not even in, in a decade. Um, uh, this does not mean that the, the ambitions uh, of the Kurds remain, of course, but I think that there has been a realization that uh, in order to gain uh, more autonomy uh, in the future or in order to be able to come to a deal with Baghdad uh, over, over distribution of the oil wealth, over the question of, of the territories that are, that are outside of their control that they claim, they actually need to engage Baghdad. Um, they cannot provoke Baghdad through, through a move such as, as the independence referendum that they, that they try. And also it's, it's not even just about uh, the Kurdistan region and the federal government, right? I mean, uh, the backlash to, to that was, was so strong um, from, from outside of Iraq as well. And uh, I think that would continue to be the case if, if there was another attempt. Okay, I don't know if there's any other question and if there is any in the, in the YouTube channel. I don't see any. Um, no, um, I'm afraid there's no one waiting so I think probably we, we, we will have um, we have some minutes to to keep uh, the line on but there's no questions and so I don't know if we can give the session for closure closer um, I really thank you for for this opportunity on learning and caring about the Iraqians and thank you very much for your for your generosity uh, being here with us and I hope you can come to Barcelona nearly and, and share a, a time with us face to face. Thank We're you so leave. much. Have for a nice me. time and a nice and a nice night. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye.
Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.